Again, welcome back, one and all, to Chronicles Presents, another episode, um, you may be aware by now, a little project we're doing where we meet up with some interesting people in and around London, they take us around some of their favourite spots, tell us a bit of the history and we have a chat about their careers, their books, tours, etc, and uh, what they're up to next. So, it's the 29th of January, we're back, you may recognise this from the video with Louis Burke, we're back outside the temporary entrance to Whitechapel Station in the East End. Um, last time we were here, Louis Burke took us around some interesting Art Deco uh, architecture in the area, but today we are here to meet Mr. Philip Hutchinson. Hello, Philip. Hello, Trevor. Where did you come from? I was standing here all the time. Oh, hey. yeah, he does this. Um, so I've met Philip actually nearly 10 years ago now, 2010, which is longer ago than either of us would probably like to admit. Um, since then, we were colleagues doing Ripper Tours for about a year and a half. We've spoken at various conferences together. Philip once introduced me as an MC at a conference dressed in a, a full bunny outfit. Yeah, we don't talk about that. It was a new experience for me, <laughs> perhaps not dare. for Philip. And, uh, <laughs> two years ago, thanks to Philip, I achieved one of my lifetime ambitions, which was getting to go around Aldrich Station, oh, yeah. which was great. But uh, what are we up to today, Philip? Well, you want me to show you some of the places in the East End connected to Joseph Merritt, the Elephant Man? That sounds like a very good idea. Let's go. We're here outside what is in 2019 UK International Saurian 22 Carat Jewels. Uh, I'm guessing this was something else before, Philip. Uh, in the reign of Victoria, this was the 123 Whitechapel Road. Obviously, it's now number 259. The number was changed, so you often do. This is really where Joseph Merrick's story in London begins. Uh, at the time that Merrick was here first, uh, this had actually been a, a waxworks owned by Mr. Cotton. And uh, it was it was sublet to to Tom Norman, who was uh, Joseph Merrick's manager. And they were here in uh, November 1884. Uh, there was a surgeon across the road at the Whitechapel at the London Hospital, uh, Sir John Bland Sutton. And uh, like many of the surgeons there, he went to see the freak shows on the Mile End Road, uh, not for, for curiosity's sake, but obviously to see if there was anything to do with, with deformities and. and uh, so, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's for research purposes. And this is where he actually saw uh, Joseph Merrick. Um, he was uh, exhibiting himself at a place called the, uh, the, the Ball and Mackerel Club, which is nearby. Uh, and he spoke to um, uh, Dr. Reginald Tuckett, who was uh, working at the London. Uh, he met Joseph Merrick here, and, uh, and he suggested that uh, Frederick Trees, who ended up being uh, Merrick's mentor and, and friend, Come and, and meet Merrick here himself. At the time, Merrick and Tom Norman were living at the back of this particular unit. Uh, they were separating the area from everywhere from everywhere else by just a curtain drawn across for their own privacy. They had uh, just one uh, gas ring, and they, they uh, made it hotter by surrounding it with bricks. But this is where they actually come and, and do the exhibition to the public for a few pence. Norman would be out here uh, ringing up business. Um, saying all these things about, about how hideous Merrick was. It, it, it's just being a, like a sideshow bar here. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, the public would go inside and uh, Merrick would exhibit himself. Merrick was not exploited by Norman in any way. I was anything. going to ask about that because that's the, the classic picture that you get given, isn't it? Isn't it awful that he was exploiting this man and making him exhibit himself? Yeah, and that's not, not true. That that's, uh, as per usual, it's a fiction made for movies and, and stage plays. Uh, Tom Norman was, was Merrick's manager. Merrick made more out of the uh, the business than Tom Norman did because not only did they split the takings 50-50, but Merrick also got all the income he made from selling uh, a very a brief uh, sheet talking about his, his life. Is that where, that's the sort of biography where the story of his mum being scared by an elephant? That's right. That's what I yeah. And, and indeed his favourite verse, uh, "Tis true my form is something on the brain, his brain got, etc. Uh, that, that is printed at the end of the short sheet that, that he had for sale. Yes. Very interesting. So, Philip, I'm not even sure what to, what to call you, really, <laughs> in terms of, I mean, you're, you're 
a DJ. Your Majesty okay, will do. Your Majesty. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's fine. So, but I mean, the DJ, which I think the, rab the uh, rabbit costume comes in useful. Yeah. You're a 78 dealer on, on eBay. Yeah. You're a ripper guide. So You're apparently. a ghost tour guide. <laughs> yeah. uh, Theatre actor and, and writer. So uh, I don't even know how you, how you define yourself, really. You're a busy man. Yeah, that'll do. Busy, that'll busy do. man. A busy, your, busy, a busy man. your majesty. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll delve into a little bit of that in a bit, maybe. But so first off, I mean, why Mary? Where, the, where did the interest, interest come from? Is it the David Lynch film? It, it would have been, yeah. yeah. When, I was a, when I was a kid, the Lynch film came out. Uh, you just see uh, images from it. And I thought The Elephant Man was a horror film. Mm. Uh, and I had no idea that, that Merrick had been a, a real-life individual. But the imagery from it, because it was a stark contrast black and white, but, you know, as Lynch was wont to do, uh, I thought it was a horror film. And I was wondering why this horror film had a had an A certificate, as it was at the time, and why I was allowed to see it. And uh, we actually watched it at school. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the point of us watching it was, <laughs> but but it was it was one of the lessons when we we watched it, and I was, I was deeply moved by it. It instantly became my favourite film. And even though, as you say, there's, there's some artistic license in it, oh, a huge most deal people of it who are interested in work still hold it up. Sure. Have a bit of effect Indeed, it, I, I was like 12 years old when we watched it at mm. school, and you know that's that, that sort of thing is not relevant to a 12 no. year old. You know, you don't care about no. historical accuracy. I suppose it's, it's similar to obviously the other link we've got, which we've mentioned a couple of times, is the Ripper, um, the Jack Ripper oh. tours, and um, similar, I suppose, to people who get into that case through watching it, whether it's the 1988 Michael Caine. Program or yeah. more recently from hell to yeah. move on. I saw some viral video put up on Facebook today where two guys from America uh, have done some reading up. They read a couple of books, so they've solved the case. Oh, it's, it's a, <laughs> great, yeah, well done, well done. The you. amount of people that Jack the Ripper was is amazing. Isn't it? Someone knew every six months. <laughs> anyway, so we are now outside the rather nice and modern uh, extension of the Royal London Hospital. <laughs> After the London Hospital, as it would have been in, in Mary's day before it became royal. Uh, that you mentioned a minute ago. So why are we here in particular, Philip? Well, this particular spot here, although it's now actually uh, one of the entrances to, and uh, one of the main entrances, is, is actually because we're standing up about as close as the public can get to where Merrick spent the last years of his life, uh, in the two small basement rooms off a place that was colloquially known as Bedstead Square. Mm. Uh, the whole, obviously, that the hospital was, was hugely redeveloped about a decade ago. And sadly, Bedstead Square and Merrick's accommodation, what was left of it, uh, all went under the bulldozer. And it now lies underneath this building. But this was part of the older grocer's ring that was added in the 1870s. And Merrick was actually moved in here in December 1886. Uh, obviously, it's, it's under the building now. It's, it, it's some, somewhere in there. And, um, and so, so this is where, where he, he spent the, in a sense, you could say, the happiest years of his life. It's the only time when, uh, when, when he actually had ironically some degree of freedom that he wasn't granted the, the amount that he should have been because uh, he, he scared the other patients and obviously a lot of them uh, were ill themselves and had infectious diseases. Uh, he, he was often a prisoner in his own accommodation. He could only go to a limited area and uh, go out and walk in the gardens at night time. Though he was granted occasional holidays which he enjoyed very much in the Midlands. So that was under the auspices of, of trees. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a Lady Louisa Knightley who owned the Forsley Hall estate in, in Northamptonshire. Uh, he was a friend of hers and uh, and that's how they got Merrick up there for various holidays. So these buildings pan round a little bit, these surviving old buildings around the back of the, what I believe is the listed frontage of the hospital. Would these be roughly contemporary, would you say? Oh, I'm down to, oh absolutely. As, it, as yeah. Bedstead Square would yes, have looked? Yes, yes, so because we could still see one of the other wings. It, it was it was symmetrical, so one of the other wings is down there, so that would have been extending down here as well. Yeah, what you're, a crane accepted, of course, but what you're, what you're seeing is, is indeed contemporaneous uh, with Merrick. This, this is the old uh, original structure. Still get a feel for it. Should we move on? Let's. Let's. So we mentioned earlier some of the many things that you're doing now. Uh, the theatre side of things. Um, I've seen some more photos and some Facebook videos. And you started doing it quite young, didn't you? And yeah. Yeah. you come back to it. Yeah, so yeah. It was the first love as such, was it? There was, well, I, I, spent, I went to drama college. I spent 12 years touring mostly kids' shows and pantomime mm -hmm. stuff, and I got too old to be doing it. 
so that's what I became a tour guide. Mm. And now I'm the other side of it by writing and directing. Yeah. But because yeah. I'm writing and directing means that when I do shows, I could be in them and write my own parts as well. No one else tells me what to do anymore. <laughs> and of course, after that, then, as you say, you got into tour guiding and collect, collecting photographs off, off eBay. Um, I know you published a couple of books about Guildford, didn't you? Mm -hmm. um, a lot from your personal archive, I think it's in your Amazon bio. And then 2009, of course, the book I really became aware of you with, the uh, that, that location thing. photographs, this yeah. thing. Tell us about the Whitby collection. Ah, well, a friend of mine, uh, Margaret, Margaret Green, uh, her uncle, uh, he took a load of photographs around the East End in the early 60s. Uh, he was an early Ripper obsessive. Uh, he had in, his interests were with jazz, Spain, and, and Jack the Rimba. And in the early 60s, when you had very little to go on apart from things like Matters and uh, and McCormick, mm. you know, this is before Rumbelo and, and Farson and, and before and, the files were accessible. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, he actually went around the East End and photographed a load of the sites connected to the Ripper. The most interesting thing about it is that he correctly identified locations that uh, we incorrectly identified years later, and now we realise that he got them right. Uh, Swallows Gardens mm. being, uh, being a, a, a main one. And you also came across the Duckfield Yard photograph. Oh, yeah. Which is the other part of this, yeah, this book. Poison yeah. Chalice, that one was. <laughs> Um, yeah. I know, again, I'm not breaking any confidences here, uh, but it's fair to say, I think you say it in that Amazon bio actually, that you, I'm sure you're expected to be interviewed about one day, um, you weren't entirely happy with the way that Duffield's Yard photograph in particular was was published? In no, I mean, I, 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 if we're being frank, I was very unhappy with the way the entire book was published. Mm. Uh, the amount of emails I went to and fro between me and the publisher, uh, they ended up just not answering my emails, that they would delete them, because you'd ask for a read receipt, and, and mm. then you get a, a receipt back saying this email's been deleted without being read. I think the editor I was working with no longer with that company, thankfully. But uh, the book was meant to be in colour, they printed it in black and white. The image was meant to be uh, gutted, so you could open a double page and see the entire thing clearly, and they've got it going straight to the spines, you can't see a bit in the middle. Uh, they were meant to be the, the image was meant to be recreated at the actual size. I didn't do any of that, uh, so no, I wasn't happy with it at all. Yeah. Well. I'm still quite a discovery. Find the, uh, oh, te the text wise, sign, I'm happy with it. Yeah, it's yeah, a shame. But, but with what they did with the images, in it, no, I wasn't yeah. happy with it. Uh, so, how did you come across that photograph? Just, just briefly. Well, I used to look on eBay every single day in descriptions as well for things that were tagged Whitechapel, Spitalfield, or Gate. And in 2007, I just saw listed from a US seller, scene of the Whitechapel murders. That's all that was put up. And there was a small image beneath it, a sepia photograph, looking nothing like any site I recognised. But it had a starting price of $4.95. So I bid on it, that was £2.41 at the time. I bid on it one, it turned up, and then I started seeing things in the image that looked very much like pension drawings in Duckfield Yard. So I sent around a load of other researchers, and they confirmed pretty quickly that it was the only extant photograph of the murder spot of this site. Moving on, we've both moved away from the world a little bit, haven't we, recently? Both yeah. it's, it's worked now. Uh, yeah. Better for mental health. So, uh, back to Merrick. Why are we here? Well, we're just outside Liverpool Street Station. Um, it's certainly a very big thing in the movie that uh, when he came back from Europe, he wasn't kidnapped to enter his own volition, but he, he, he was robbed by his, uh, his agent out there who took all his savings, which were quite considerable by that time. He managed to somehow get back to England. And although it's not absolutely 100% definite, the general supposition is, and it's a big thing's made of it in the film, that when he got back to uh, England, he ended up at Liverpool Street Station. Uh, a lot of people were, were curious about the fact he was by this time wearing the cloak and, and the, the big cap and the hat, and obviously aroused a lot of interest uh, of a negative kind, and he, he ran away from everyone, and uh, the police got him into a third-class waiting room. Interesting, as Bishop Gate Police Station is directly across the road mm. from us, so they probably came from there. Who knows, because we're only talking two years before the Ripper murder, this is the 24th of June 1986. So, for all we know, so the policeman that actually found Mary may also have been involved in, in some, yeah. some way with the Ripper case. That would be an interesting thing to look out for. But he was taken to a third class waiting room and uh, barricaded, barricaded in there by the police. And I've been looking at plans of how Liverpool Street Station looked at the mm. time, and there's four sets of waiting rooms. There's two waiting rooms without a class designated that are both right next to a dining room and open up to the platform, like think that's first class. Yeah. Then there's a second class one, which is noted as being second class, and there's a third set that's on the outside of the building right next to the taxi cabs. And it says a third class waiting room. There are men's and women's uh, waiting rooms. 
uh, for the third class, and and they would have been pretty much about where, where we are right now. It's opening on onto Bishopsgate. So if the story about Merrick being taken to a third class waiting room and then he gave his uh, trees, his business card, which he kept for some years, to the police, and that's how they tracked him down at the Whitechapel Hospital and then trees picked him up from here. Moved on by then. That's right, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's another train of thought that maybe Merrick actually walked up to Whitechapel uh, himself uh, from Hoburn um, and, and knocked on the door of the hospital. But, but the, 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 gem, the generally perceived one is, is that he, he came to Liverpool Street Station. And either way, it was trees, and he was, was the only yes, person yes, he, he knew, really. Absolutely, he was looking for trees, yeah. And again, a bit like we were saying about Tom Norman, trees also gets demonised a little bit in some of the some well, of the retellings. I, I think the movie is, is too kind to it. Okay. Trees, um, there's this whole thing Anthony Hopkins playing trees in, in the movie. He's going on, he's judging himself, saying, you know, am I, am I no better? than the people that went before. Well, actually, he wasn't. Uh, although he gave Merrick shelter and comfort and safety, uh, he also exploited him far more than he had been under Tom Norman because he called the shots when he was in the freak shows. By going to Trees, he then had to make himself available for exhibition at any time. Um, and and he, you know, he, did, he did become a prisoner, a, 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 you know, a prisoner, a, a bird in a gilded cage, really, I suppose is a, a good way of putting it became a subject, a research yes. subject, rather than, yeah, a partner in a way. With, with Tom indeed. Yeah. Now, Trees was indeed a friend to him, mm. but he definitely pulled the strings. Interesting. And now a weather spoon. So, Philip, tell me about Christ. <laughs> it's a very interesting... Uh, Musical sample oh, was posted on Facebook recently. Oh God! I thought you were talking, talking about religion generally. I thought this was a trick question. Oh bloody hell! Where do I start? Seriously? Okay, okay. When I was at sixth form, me and my best mate Peter Hussey, who's been lost in time for many years now, we used to hang around after sixth form or spend all the lunch breaks in the music department, smashing hell out of pianos and drums and the primitive electric keyboards they had and I would put everything down on a dictating machine. Peter was a good musician. Um, I like to stomp over everything in my boots and that, that's how the musical thing came about. We'd have these rather like Half Man Half Biscuit or the mm. Bonzo Dog Doo Dog Band. We'd have proper songs, maybe sounded a bit like the Smiths yep. or James because Peter liked his jangly guitars and strange chords and I'd just be bawling over the top of it thinking about things like throwing up and, and eating inappropriate bodily fluids <laughs> but not in a dark punk way just in a very sick and silly way <laughs> it was quite good fun yeah and, and, we, and we were called Christ we started off as being Christ and Satan but it sounded too much like a heavy metal band mm. so we shortened it to Christ I thought we put an exclamation mark at the end yeah. not only is it offensive but, it's an, but it is as people hear it Christ <laughs> and that was the whole point and you were yeah. ahead of the time once we had Mother the Darren Aronofsky film recently with the exclamation oh, yeah. mark. Yeah, we couldn't make a musical over by seeing the exclamation mark at the end. We did get, we were in the Music Maker catalogue at the time. We recorded mm. to, for um, for Magic Moments at Twilight Time. Uh, a friend of mine, Mick, who ran, ran this uh, small scale cassette label as it was at the time in Surrey. Mm. And our things were put out officially. So you could actually go to a record shop and order these things from a record shop. Which is mad! <laughs> And then theatre, as we said, and then that sort of went away a bit. Started doing the tours, Guildford Goes tours and, and River tours. Wrote the books that we've spoken briefly about, and now, as you touched on earlier, back to the theatre with your own company, Lucky Dog. With yeah. Rick Tony. So uh, I've seen two of Lucky Dog's uh, productions. The one I haven't seen is the Laurel and Hardy. Uh, hats off to Laurel and Hardy. It's a Laurel and Hardy review, would you say? It's a cabaret. Fair? Cut right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, but certainly the Bethel Green, the, the player on the, using the oral uh, test. A he heavy Bethel piece Green of work, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but, but very, you know, very, very good. Does what it sets out to do, certainly. And then the, you've done the Merrick play, of course. Yeah. Uh, which was, uh, how did you find writing that? Right, oh, easy. Mm. That sounds really? Yeah, actually, it, it, it was. Uh, the more research that's been done on an individual, the harder it gets to write a book because you get so many conflicting accounts. So don't do a play about Jack the Ripper unless you want it to be a piece of drama. Um, the, I, t I tend to write things about true stories. Um, and, and the whole purpose of the Lucky Dog is to actually been, show the truth about them rather than dramatic versions. Because all these things, like obviously Merrick's got loads of different versions about him. 
and, and they're, they're, they're fictions. Uh, they're, they've taken the facts and, and they've turned it into something that it really isn't, rather like the current Laurel and Hardy film. I was wondering if you had any yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, I've got thoughts on that. Um, and, and so the whole point of writing these plays was to actually base everything entirely on fact. Uh, if, if it loses dramatic tension because of that, then so be it. The great thing about writing plays based entirely on fact is that people who are researchers in it and people with the best of interest are only too happy to support you and endorse what you're doing because you're telling the truth. Mm. Okay, well, interesting. So, very thanks for coming along today, Philip. A rather chilly day. This is not uh, raining. Yeah, it's not raining, not yet. But it's been interesting. Rip tour tonight? Yeah. Best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's been good. Thank you for watching, everybody. Um, yeah, please check out uh, for some more of these videos. And uh, obviously, chronicles-uk.com. Check out our tours there. And luckydogtheatreproductions.com, I believe. Is that right? Do get along. Really, really good. And uh, we look out. What's in the works at the minute? Anything new? New plays? Yeah. 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 We're, we're doing a, a new performance for Brighton Fringe this year. Laurel and I did some radio scripts as well, and we're doing them for the first time. And also, I've just done a bit of a, a, a sidestep for us. I've, I've done a kids' play. Uh, the 1950s. Back to where it started. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the 1950s classic, The Red Balloon, uh, oh. the movie. I've done an adaptation of that, and we're performing that for the first time this year. Keep an eye out. Well, thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, see you on the streets, as I say. Right. Thanks for that. Cheers, Brenda. Good evening and welcome to Kevin McLee's Erotic Cabaret featuring Bonzo the Dog. Thank you, Bonzo. And tonight's special guests are Christ from the Brother, especially for us. Okay, boys, hit it.